Welcome to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. Our goal is to help you maximize your church's potential. You'll hear from top leaders in children's, student, and family ministry about the principles and practices they use. Now here's your host, Nick Blevins. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 215 of the podcast. Christmas is right around the corner. We've got a great interview for you in this episode. I talk with Kevin Harris from Radical Mentoring. I've known of Radical Mentoring for a number of years. They've done a great job creating a system, curriculum, really just a culture of developing disciples and leaders through a mentoring process. And so this is a family ministry podcast, and primarily what Radical Mentoring does is for adults. However, what we talk about applies to next gen ministry. And so I hope you'll listen and think about what are the ways that we can apply these same principles and philosophies to next gen ministry. You'll be able to get all the links and notes at nicklevins.com slash episode 215. Before we jump in, I want to give you a heads up about something coming up in the new year for Ministry Boost. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but I'm really excited about it. It's going to help you with volunteers, which we all could use more help there, right? Recruiting and developing and onboarding and all of that. It's something that we've had in the works before COVID, but COVID kind of put a pause on that like it did so many other things. And now we feel like it's time. It's time for it to show up, to be released. It's going to help you. I'm really excited for it. So keep it eye out, keep an ear out after the holidays, really as soon as we get towards New Year's. uh, We're going to release that and it might be something you're interested in signing up for. It's going to be for the month of January. So keep an eye out for that. This podcast will take a break the next couple weeks, Christmas week, New Year's Eve week. We will take off Then we'll be back kicking off the new year. I've got some great interviews in store for you there. So let's go ahead now and jump into my conversation with Kevin Harris all about radical mentoring. Today, I'm talking with Kevin Harris. Welcome to the podcast, Kevin. Nick, thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. Yeah, it is. Tell us about yourself and about Radical Mentoring, which I know we'll get more into, but give us kind of the intro there. Yeah, so I I won't go back to where I was born and when I was born. That may take it too (laughs) far back. But I'll tell you, when I first interacted with with Radical Mentoring was in 2002 when our founder uh, asked me to be a part of his mentoring group. And so the way he asked me to do it is I got an email that said, write your obituary and send that back to me, which um, <laughs> nice. is a little intimidating. But uh, that was you know, sort of his attempt to, to see what your vision was for your life and you know, what do you want your kids to say at your funeral and who's going to be there and um, all those kind of things. And so I first met our founder, Reggie Campbell, who recently passed away earlier this year in, uh, in February of 2002 and had a... 12 month journey with him that um, is really the foundation of what radical mentoring is today. But what I was able to glean from Reggie was a deep friendship. I had some, I had a, a father wound and then I lost my dad when I was in high school. And, um, and I had just sort of positioned myself as a, you know, always keeping arms distance, not getting too close, some bad performance based theology. And Reggie was the first guy, first man, really, that I had sat down with at his dining room table with a group of other men who just lived an authentic life. He was willing to share the bumps and the bruises. He was willing to share the high points. Um, and all he really wanted to do was pour out what God had done in his life into the cups of other men with the hopes being that we would catch some of it. Um, and what Reggie and I, what Reggie caught was a case of Kevin sticking to him for a long time. And so we just developed a long friendship. And about seven years ago, after a, a business career that was in the financial services business and, and traveling every week and learning some really hard and, and hard lessons, um, Reggie just kind of said to me, hey, I've got this crazy vision that you would consider coming to uh, help me kind of run radical mentoring. At that point, it had gone from Reggie's dining room table. We had begun to have conversations with churches. And I think he sensed in me a desire to get back on purpose and a um, a desire to just, just kind of do what God had called me to do, which I know sounds a little Christian-y, but I do feel like that that was really a huge part of it. And and I laugh only because when I met Reggie in 02, he was an entrepreneurial business guy. And I sort of began to selfishly pray that Reggie would be my exit strategy for my, you know, the the rat race I was in and that, um, you know, he would find a business, buy a business, bring some, need to bring a sales and marketing guy in uh, to help him. And um, that was 
that was uh, the story. That was God's plan. It just didn't exactly play out exactly the way I had envisioned it. But mm-hmm. so we talked for a couple of years and fi- for five years, I've been um, on the on the team here at Radical Mentoring, just helping get this ministry into the hands of leaders and churches all across the country. So it's been really fun. Yeah, and I've been familiar with Radical Mentoring for some time, and I've really loved the approach. And I, I'd love for you to share more details about what is it. We'll talk about how it works. And then knowing that a lot of the audience listening to this podcast, leading children's and student ministry, we'll talk about kind of what is Radical Mo- Mentoring, how it works, and then apply that to like that next-gen world and how that could fit in there. But give us you know an overview yeah. of what Radical Mentoring is like and how it works. Absolutely. So – um, what we sort of um, ascribe to is that um, holding men to a higher commitment in terms of sort of a, a next step in their faith is a really important part of it. And and well, we work with a lot of churches and a lot of churches have men's environments. But one of the things that they really struggle is, is what do you do next for your men? And so what Reggie was doing in 02 on his own was really saying, look, I as the mentor, I'm a bus- I'm busy. But I'm going to commit to you. I'm going to give you three hours of time every month. You're going to be at every meeting. You're going to do the homework assignments. You're going to memorize the scripture. You're going to be fully committed to this process for a 12 month period of time. And then our mentoring season is over. And so the idea was, you know, not for all men. And the idea is that it's supplemental to what most churches do. But that if there are men who you know in your heart are seeking to go further and deeper in their faith, but maybe they don't necessarily want to be taught, um, but they really would be attracted to sitting at the feet at the dining room table of somebody who's just a little further down the road than they are, um, putting them in an environment where they can share their stories first, where it's a grace-filled, safe environment where they have a chance to just connect authentically with God and with others, understanding sort of uh, who God is, how they see God, how God sees them, understanding grace and prayer. You kind of take them through this inner man journey of, of, of a little bit better understanding of all those things. And then you begin to shift them outward and get them to begin to think about how does that impact their marriage and how does that impact their parenting and their ministry in the workplace. And so it's really just designed to be a journey that takes takes men through this process in a small group environment. So it's typically a mentor and somewhere between four and eight um, mentees that are ideally in similar ages and stages of life. And what they're really doing is they're just Again, it's not the mentor is the guy that knows everything and is the is the greatest teacher in the world. He's just a guy that's available, has a story that God has used in his life, and he has a desire to want to share that with others. And so what we've done is just created a process by which a church can um, come to the site, create an account, really see what it looks like and sort of understand everything from beginning to end. And so that's what we've really tried to do is say, how do you how do you get this in the hands of somebody where it's easy to repeat? And tell us a little bit about if if a church was going to do it and they're going to put together a group, like if they're going to do one group, they're going to put it together and they're going to meet and do all those things. Like how much of it is, I'll call it curriculum, you know, like a plan yeah, that absolutely. mentoring provides, how much of it is kind of like on their own, figuring that out, how much of it is you should really run it like this schedule, kind of like you were alluding to a little, some of that right there versus how much is like, you're a little free, could kind of do it this way. Like, what does that look like? Yeah. So what we, we kind of I, I don't it's not that I don't like the word content, but I do think it it sort of it sort of creates this environment of teacher student. And what we really what we really like to talk about is we want to give you a track to run on. Mm-hmm. And so what we know about the track that you need to run on at your church might be very different from the track that somebody else needs to run on. And so we wanted to create something that is flexible and adaptable to the context and the culture of your individual churches. So um, if somebody was to come onto the website, we would we would sort of say we've got personal guides, myself and others on our team that will help do this. We kind of say, hey, from beginning to end, here's an email you can send out to invite people to apply. Here's an application you can use. Here's a framework of a conversation you might want to have with your senior pastor. So we kind of cover all those front end things. And then we have what we call a matrix and a binder, 
which sort of says, hey, here's what we would recommend. Here's the recommended books. Here's the recommended homework assignments and the recommended scripture to memorize. But the reality is I know that what what is in our recommended book list, you, Nick, may have six or seven other books you've read that you think are better. Well, we want you to put your cursor in, delete the name of our book and put the name of something else in. Because at the end of the day, the first thing we do is we start with this story retreat where you create space for men to really be known by each other and share those stories and, you know, not share the, you know, not share the Sunday school version of their story, but just share the true authentic selves where God has showed up and God continues to show up. And then sort of the track that comes behind it is, is really there to help engage in conversations. And we give you conversation guides and all these other things. But the reality is if men are known, the conversation starts to flow um, a lot more easily. And so the other thing we would say is it's got to be a really flexible schedule in that, you know, I, I think this is a back porch environment. So we want to we really want to say meet in the home of your mentor. And from that, we would say, you know, we lay all this out. You got to really figure out the scheduling first. So everybody starts to bring their calendars and you work out all the dates in advance. And some groups meet on Monday nights. I hear of groups that meet on Sunday mornings before church starts and they meet once a month for three hours and they really sort of say, hey, here's what it is. We're sticking to it. We're not going to move off of the schedule. So it, we sort of give some framework for how to do that. But the reality is we do want to create a flexible process and help understand the flexible schedule. Because, as you know, most things in the in the church oftentimes involve around meeting in this particular room at this particular time, which doesn't really work for everybody. And so if you can get the right guys willing to commit and they can work through the details of the schedule, most men can give uh, three hours a month to something versus saying, hey, we're meeting every every week for an hour this month. That's going to be harder for some to do, but some can will be attracted to the idea of meeting once a month for three hours, having to do some work in between to prepare for the next session. How would you say this is like different than small groups? Like you just alluded to once a month, three hours as opposed to once a week and all, all those kinds of things. But for a church that's thinking, well, is, is this just a supplement to groups? Like would a church want, you know, these 10 guys in a small group and in radical mentoring? Is it, is it a replacement? Is it a supplement? Like, how do you view that? Especially in your own experience, having been a part of it, how do you yeah. view churches seeing this in conjunction with a small group strategy that a lot of churches probably have? Yeah, we are. We want to be supplemental because I do think, you know, the worst thing you can do if you've got a, a husband and wife and a married couples group and they're committing to that to go every, you know, w- once a week for an hour, hour and a half. All of a sudden the husband says, hey, honey, I, I've got to stop doing this for a year. I can't do our group. I've got to go do this other thing. All that does is create a level of animosity and tension that we don't want to be a part of. But we do believe that if guys bring their calendars and they have written on that schedule, here's my small group and we meet every Wednesday night from seven to eight, then Wednesday nights will not be a time when you schedule radical mentoring. You'll begin to schedule around that because the last thing you want is to do two things. Number one, create tension at home, but it also creates tension with church staff because you don't want your small group ministry leaders frustrated that this thing's happening and now you're pulling everybody apart or you don't want the volunteers from your children or your student ministry to, you don't want them to think they've got to leave that and go do this other thing. And so that's sort of the magic of that three hour commitment is it does become really supplemental. The other thing it does is it really strengthens the small group ministry in that, you know, oftentimes our groups are, you know, they're, they obviously are they serve a, a great purpose of com- building community and, and growing together. But, you know, sometimes your groups are only as strong as your leaders. And, and so we, I've had churches that have said, we don't let any small group leaders go through mentoring. We want the small group leaders, because they're already leading, to identify who are the next level people in this group that they think should be in a leadership position. And we want them to be the ones that participate in this mentoring environment because – as they're experiencing the mentoring, they're understanding how to lead a group well, they're beginning to sort of understand the dynamics of transparency and authenticity. And then when they get through the end of this experience, they're more prepared to lead a group on their own. And so it really does serve as a great way to develop leaders inside the church because you're just getting them at the feet of leaders who are a little for a little further ahead of them. Yeah. How does 
That makes sense to me. How does a church, and I want to talk, we'll shift gears here in a second, talk next gen, children's ministry, student ministry leaders, like the overlaps and how that can help and serve, uh, you know, leaders that are in those roles. But I'm also curious for a church that's like, hey, I'm, I'm interested in this. Uh, how do I get started? I know you've got resources on the site, but like, yeah, what does that yeah. look like for a church to say, we're implementing this? Yeah, I, I, what I tell every church I talk to is start slow. You know, don't make this, you know, don't let this be the thing that you are, you know, announcing from the pulpit every week saying we're starting a mentoring ministry. Because what I typically hear is when it becomes really broadly advertised, it waters down the impact because you may get people who want to be a part of it that may not be people that the church wants to wants to put in this kind of an environment. So it it's, it's not exclusive in that, um, you know, you're keeping people in and out. But what you are really doing is you're wanting to create early on the shoulder tap environment where you may have a lay leader. A lot of our churches are completely lay led. They've got a lay leader who's uh, deeply entrenched in the church, who is would be really passionate about something like this. And that leader kind of shoulder taps six to eight guys and says, hey, here's something I'm thinking about doing. I'd love for you to give it a shot, understand it. Um, here's an application just so I can kind of get to know you a little better. Or they have, you know, or they go to the senior pastor, staff pastor and say, who are some other men that you think could benefit from being a part of this? And it sort of starts slow. And so what happens is lay leader, a group of guys or senior pastor, staff pastor and a group of mentees, they just launch into this slowly. And then what happens is they start to see the life change that's occurring in the lives of these men. These men become great referral sources to say, hey, I think these are some other guys that could benefit from this. And then the, you know, the waterfall, the flywheel starts to turn and then the momentum begins to uh, to grow. But what we typically see is churches have got guys with capacity who are dying to lead, who'd be attracted to a environment like this. And so it's really a matter of casting some vision for them and then casting some vision for some potential mentees, putting those groups together and then beginning to sort of let the, let that be the place where the momentum starts. So if we think children's ministry, student ministry, uh, and applying here, and I know this has obviously been implemented, like you were part of it, you've been in churches that implement it, that have strong children's and student ministries. So when I'm thinking about that as a next gen leader, and how this can apply. I mean, one of the first things I think about is dad. And if dad were to get in some type of leadership mm -hmm. development group, uh, a radical mentoring type group, um, one, I think about the guys in our church to be great leaders of it, kind of like the people you're talking about, if they're not already right. leading a small group. But they might be leading in our kids or student ministry, but still have room to do something like this and mentor other men. But I think about that. I think about the benefit of – you know, a lot of churches have a mindset of if we can reach dad, we can reach the family. And because, you know, the statistics show that overwhelmingly. Um, so I get that. A lot of churches that will say that's like if there's one person they want to reach, it's, you know, it's dad that's 35 years old or whatever, because they know that the effects of that. So those are all the things that are coming to my mind yeah, when I think I about it. this in the next gen world. And if mm -hmm. you could lean in there and help dads. And again, this is where it's like, I don't know, is the responsibility outside of the normal next gen leader scope? And it dips into like uh, discipleship, small groups, whoever leads that in the church, probably, but they're going to be interested. So I just I guess I'll open the floor to what are your thoughts about yeah. how this can relate to next gen leaders? Yeah, I think what, what we have seen, and you've probably seen some of this research, kind of the growing young churches are ones that have got older, wiser members who want to be engaged and they've got next gen leaders that are coming up that want to contribute. And, and research says those next gen leaders love the idea of a of having a mentor. You mentioned discipleship. I think mentoring and discipleship are the same thing. I think all you're really doing is you're modeling in both of those environments what it's like to live an authentic life with Christ, what it's like to give that away. And so, but I think there's an attraction of these next gen um, leaders that would love to sort of have that experience to, to be led by somebody who may have had a similar experience, but happens to be, you know, a step or two down the road from where, um, where they are. And they just would love to be able to sit and understand and learn and get to know that person because it only will serve to benefit themselves, but also will serve to benefit the church. Um, we've seen churches, one of the things we have inside of our track is this idea of a personal ministry plan. And the idea behind that personal ministry plan is as as you're wrapping up this mentoring season, 
you're going to begin to ask men to identify some places where they have a heart to serve. You're also going to have the church sort of say, hey, here's some places where we need leadership. Not every mentee is going to mentor a group. So they they may all of a sudden realize that they really have a heart to speak into the lives of the youth because they know that's where they got off the rails and they want to be able to try to try to prevent that from happening in a generation behind. Or they may want to engage in children's ministry because they know it'll make them better at home. So it allows the church to present opportunities where they need help. And it helps these men um, really sort of find find out the places where their heart is telling them they desire to serve. Mm-hmm. And I can, I mean, obviously all of this to me is, is kind of secondary, right? Like the purpose of Radical mentoring is for the people taking the groups and their own development and discipleship, like you describe it. The yeah. you know plus benefit is they might you know jump in and serve, like you're saying. I could see it being used there, where you're getting more leaders, more people to serve because they've been through met- radical mentoring, and it pushes them to do that. I could also see where you've already got people serving, and it um, helps grow their leadership. Like they'll take on it. more as a leader after no being doubt. through radical mentoring. Does that make sense? Yeah. Makes total sense. I think that's that's where uh, you know we we sort of our heart is we give all this this we give this away. So for anybody that's you know thinking when's Kevin going to tell us it's going to be a thirty nine ninety nine a month subscription, our heart has been to give this ministry away because we know it will be paid forward by men and churches who've been touched by it. And so I th- I think the reality is each church is different. Some churches will look at that and go, hey, I know Nick's a great leader, but I know he could benefit from from being pushed a little more, being led a little more. So I think he's the right person. Some churches will say, hey, Nick, you're doing a great job. Who are the other volunteers that are coming in a little less frequently that you think would be the right people to benefit from this? Or Nick, we think you could lead this. Mm-hmm. The other thing I think about, too, is I think of student ministry. And student ministry changes, you know, so much over the years. And um, and certainly there's a lot of that change kind of going on right now. But regardless of how it changes, a lot of it always just comes back to discipleship, one-on-one, one-on-a-few, you know, a lot of the same things you'd find in this radical mentoring. And so I guess I had two thoughts, like off the top of my head. I think about uh, the leaders that lead in student ministry could benefit from radical mentoring because in many ways that's what they're doing with students, you know, if they're small group leaders. And then two, I do wonder, like, and I know, I know you have this. You also have the same kind of thing for women. We should talk about that at some point. But um, but anyway, I think about students. I think about students and like, what would the same model look like in student ministry? Is it a supplement? And that happens. You think of student ministries had to have like a student leadership program, and they're doing something different. I could see that here. What do you think about all of that? You know, we have seen. You know, we don't have a you know student kind of a model because what we've learned over time is um, students are already really busy and their schedules are overworked and they've already reading about some college, if it's college students, they're reading a bunch of stuff already. And so um, we haven't you know, come up with an official plan for students, but we've had other people take this and adopt it exactly like you're talking about for, you know, I've got a guy here in Atlanta who really wants to invest in high school seniors. And so he gets a group of six high school seniors and he doesn't have them read books. He has them listen to a sermon or read a couple articles. And obviously he's got to modify some of the assignments, but that's just the place where his, his heart yearns. And so he's, he's taken our model and said, let's just sort of create it so that it works. And it's created, it's been less about, developing leaders for, or, you know, or kind of creating a student leadership dynamic. It's been more about how do I get high school senior boys prepared for what's going to happen when they walk onto a college campus and they're going to be confronted with all the realities of, of college life, as well as teachers who may not believe the thing, same things they are. And, and so that's sort of been his passion, but the challenge with students, high school or, or college is really just the, the complexity of their schedules and, you know, are they even going to be willing to commit and, and honor those commitments? So it can be a little trickier, but it certainly can be customized and applied for that. Yeah, I could definitely see the benefit there. What are some of the, like, tell us a little bit about some of the stories or the impact you've seen. Um, I'm thinking both on a personal level, you know, for people who've gone yeah, through this. Yeah. But then even for churches that have implemented it over a period of time to where it's grown, you know, it's not just one group or two groups or three groups or whatever. I'm sure yeah. if there's an impact that a ripple effect, you know, that has affected other areas of the church. What's that been like? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's really beautiful when you get to see it. And so, as you know, this year has been a been sort of a mess for everybody. But I was able to go and visit a church um, in a smaller town of South Carolina. The church has 500 to 700 people coming every week. And I went to their last commencement ceremony and they had 150. They've had 150 men in total that have come through radical mentoring through that church. But the greatest part about it was. It was the former graduates that were cooking the breakfast, the former graduates that were serving the breakfast. It was the former graduates that were sort of ushering part of the, you know, part of the service along. It was the families of that church that, you know, it wasn't just, hey, this is a graduation for men. We want these husbands to invite their wives and their kids to come experience this. It was hearing the mentors sort of say, hey, this is, you know, I did this once and it was fun. I did this a second time and I started to feel myself come more alive. And now I can't imagine myself not leading a group like this going forward. And so, you know, getting to sort of drop in into that environment is so impactful for me as as one of our leaders to see that. But then it's also, you know, sometimes I do get the individual stories via email from you know, a, a survey that's been sent in or a, a mentor that, you know, sort of says the same thing. Like I've, I've done this the third, this is my third year doing it. And I, I can't imagine this group will be as transparent as the last group. We're back from our story retreat and these guys were more transparent than ever. And I feel like God's going to do so much work in this group. And I didn't, I didn't really think it would be like this based on what I've had the first couple of years. And so you do start to you know, hear those stories as well. And so, um, and we do, you know, anybody that creates an account has access to their own application and their own survey system. And so we've had a lot of these surveys done and there's the statistical data of, you know, we're seeing men deepen their relationships with Jesus, growing in their marriages, becoming better friends. We see men giving more to their churches and to local um, Christian causes. So the statistics are great, but you're exactly right, Nick. It's the stories that come out of it. You know, I think of a my group. I've, I'm now leading my fourth group. And so, you know, you end a group with these guys and you've invested so much, but then you're going into another group. And so you sort of leave it as, you know, if you when you guys need me, my phone is always available, but I may not be as the mentor, the best at pursuing each one of you all the time. And when my phone rings from a guy from a group one year, two years, three years ago, and and there's something going on in his life, not always positive, not always negative, but he's seeking out. Uh, he's reaching back into that mentoring experience. It just it just does something for me as the mentor to sort of know that I've made myself available and God's continuing to remind you know, put me on these guys hearts when they when they have a have something that they need to sort of flush out and think about. So it is the personal connection that's the most important. Tell me about because obviously this was started for men and groups for men and then you have a different name, I think, and a different thing. Yeah, but yeah. similar option for women, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, you know, when you, when husbands start to change, the wives begin to sort of get curious about what happens. And, but, you know, as you know, probably in in your church and other churches in your area, women's ministry is typically not the issue. Sure. And so we, you know, we've always been a little hesitant to step into women's ministry because we knew it was going to be different content, um, different, you know, just different books and other things. But over the last two years, through some divine conversations with women who'd been leading what they would call radical mentoring groups with women, we were able to sort of create a content and a structure that will look and feel and flow a lot like radical mentoring, but we'll, we'll have a, um, will be for women. And we call that known collective. So you've got radical mentoring is the men known collective is the women's um, mentoring model. And I'll send you the links and everything for those, but they'll really kind of look and feel, feel the same in terms of structure, but obviously the, the, the insides will be a little bit different. Yeah, definitely. Um, I also want to say, you mentioned how it's free and we talked a little bit about how the church would implement it and the resources and things like that. But tell us a little bit, I have one last question after that, but tell us a little bit about how it's free. How does that work? How are you able to do this like (laughs) a ministry and support that? But then how does that work for churches? How, you know, it makes it obviously easier for them to try I live, I live in my car. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and, uh, exactly. That must be how it is. <laughs> I, I dumpster dive and, and get things out of the dumpster to eat. You know, it's we we uh, it's really a, it is a God thing because, 
you know, our heart was is we want to get this in the hands of men and leaders. But our belief is that as men and leaders and churches begin to experience what happens inside these groups, they will be the ones that come back and fund mentoring or radical mentoring in the future. And so, you know, I don't want to say it's free for the fr- it's free for the first year. And then as I follow up with you and our team begins to gets to hear more of the stories, I, I'm going to ask you to give back to radical mentoring as a way to further our ministry so that we can continue to put it in the hands of churches and, and men and, o- and other leaders. Um, and God has really blessed that. And, and we we've been able to see that give back happen. We've been able to see really consistent donors that come back to us and are willing to pay back the experience so that we can then continue to make that resource available. So we're fully donor funded and supported, which has been really neat to be able to talk to big churches and small churches and everything in between to say, hey, we, I, I, I know what's going to happen on the other side of it. Um, I, just, I just don't want you to feel like this is some contractual thing or it's a it's a content model that you're, you know, you're paying for. I just I just think um, we just, we've operated differently than that. Yeah. And you're I, so I suppose you're a nonprofit 501c3. You got it. Yeah. And that's how you accept those donations. So I wanted to ask my last question about it is um, you mentioned how like some student ministries have adapted it. The high school senior example, things like that. I'm sure church has adapted. And before we recorded, you and I were talking about. Uh, some of the co- co- the ties to North Point Community Church because the your founder Reggie Campbell was involved there from the beginning, played a big role in leading that. And North Point, d- you know, does this under the banner of leadership development groups, right? So I'm just I'm curious, like, what do they adapt when they call it leadership development groups? You know, because again, I when I hear about it, when you talk about, it, I think discipleship, discipleship leadership, though, very you know, very linked there in in so many ways. Um, especially if we just talk about leadership broad and we all lead ourselves and all that. But I'm just curious, what does it look like there? Or what have you seen other churches adapted to? Because the other, another big conversation that has been, ha- been had in church world the last number of years is leadership development, pipe leadership, pipelines, right? Structures and trying to hand off more ministry, which I, I would say most churches do need. So I'm glad that that's been a, a yeah, conversation, yeah. but I'm just curious, have, has any church, even North Point, kind of, I don't know, use this for that as well as discipleship and growth for mentees? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Most churches will call it radical mentoring. We've got a church um, that calls it discipleship development groups because it is what they, they call it DDG, which because discipleship is sort of their, um, their mantra. Um, But what North Point did, you know, the guy that sort of helped us figure out the way to act to get our way into North Point, despite Reggie being involved in North Point from the beginning, was really to understand that North Point's need was they're a groups based church. They had but they had um, more groups than they had group leaders available. And so what they sort of sensed that need. And so what they were really been leveraging radical mentoring for has been spiritual development. It's been spiritual formation. It's been discipleship. But the output for them was focused on getting more leaders so that their group's ministry could thrive. And so what happened specifically to their men's ministry is that they had more men leaders equipped and ready to lead men's small groups than they had men's small groups ready to start. So they began to see and have seen a growth in in leaders that have come through the process. But that's a little bit of a rarity. You know, I, I don't I don't wake up every morning and get excited about um, leadership development mm-hmm. because yeah. I do think you can find leadership development in a lot of different places. But I know if if mentoring is happening and discipleship is happening and it's creating men who have got deeply rooted lives with Jesus and their lives are fully integrated horizontally in their relationships and vertically with Christ, they're going to be incredible leaders. So leadership development becomes the output, whether or not you want it, whether or not you think that's what you want on the front end or not. If you have a Mm -hmm. disciple making culture, you will create disciple makers through this process because they're experiencing authentic leadership and they're experiencing what that looks like. They're also going to be really great leaders, but you may not want great leaders. You just really want disciple makers. And so it is a little bit of that both and that I do think. The process, the mentoring, the discipleship is really the the process that happens and the output 
may may vary for different churches, but North Point specifically, they called it LDG because they wanted to go to folks and say, hey, we see you as a next generation leader at our church. And we've created an environment where you can be connected with a group of other guys and a mentor that's further ahead than you. And we want you to experience this so that you are more prepared to lead in the future. So leadership became the language that they really wrapped around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, but I, and the way you describe it too, I get like, that's, it's like, it's like a bonus output. It's not the input or the primary purpose or anything like that. You got it. Well, any, anything else you would add, or I always like to wrap up asking, how can people connect with you? Obviously they can check out the website and social. Tell us all about that. Yeah, you can find us at, um, radicalmentoring.com or you can find us at known collective that's the the women's ministry and if you go to one you can find the other so both of those work the socials are at radical men at radical mentors is uh, where you'll find us on social and at known and worthy will where you'll find us on instagram and then if you come to the website you can create the free account you'll be able to access all the content and then we'll assign you a guide from our team who will then uh, be, just be willing to work with you to, to first see if it even fits for your church and then help you think about what that implementation looks like. We don't want to just give you a process online and no people. We really want to create both. We want to be really personal and get our get our hands dirty with the churches as they think about how this works. Hey, that's great. I'm sure churches you know, would love that kind of help. So thanks for taking time to share with us on the podcast and for doing this. I, I know I've always loved uh, this ministry, when I knew there was an opportunity for us to have you on the podcast, I was like, yes, definitely, because uh, I love the work that you're doing and uh, how you're helping churches. And I, I think it's a it's a definitely a big need. I mean, you mentioned earlier, like um, when we were talking about women's groups. Also, I remember there was a time as probably eight years ago now, maybe even ten, but in our church, uh, when we realized that we were connecting three women into small groups for every one man. So. Mm-hmm. And I don't think, you know, I think that's nor- not normal, but it's common. You know what I mean? That's probably more common. I 100% agree. Yeah. Yeah. And so, no like, doubt. other opportunities like this, and obviously with Known Collective, you've seen it work with women as well, but um, but for men and to get them connected and in, in intentional mentorship, I think it's just a great thing. So, I love what you do. Thanks for coming on the podcast to talk about it. Appreciate it. Hey, Nick. Nick, thanks for what you do. This is, it's, it's great to be with you. And, um, you're equipping a lot of leaders and that's an incredibly important thing. I love the radical mentoring organization, the people, the process. I think it's a great thing. And a few action items I thought of coming out of that interview. One is to check out radical mentoring, obviously get the resources, free resources, lots of great content there that you can get. Second step, start one mentoring group. Again, you know, to roll this thing out. Like it's, you know, 30 groups you're going to launch, or it's going to be your small group program or discipleship philosophy or whatever, but just start with one, start one mentoring group in your ministry. Ideally, I think of who are the volunteers that serve in your ministry. Can you handpick some to be part of a group and try just one group? And then the other thing you could consider, the third action item I thought of is apply this concept to leadership development the same way that North Point does. And we dug into that a little bit to see what that looks like, but all of us could probably use a good leadership development system within our volunteer teams. And maybe, maybe this is it. So you can get all the links and notes and everything at nickblevins.com slash episode 215. Again, I mentioned that we'll take a couple weeks off from the podcast here, pick it up in the new year. And when we do, we'll be launching something with Ministry Boost to help you with volunteers that I am really excited about. So I hope you'll check that out. You can look for that after Christmas. Hope you have a great Christmas and a happy new year. And I'll catch you in the first episode of 2021 of the Family Ministry Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. We hope this helps you maximize your church's potential. We would love to hear stories of how you apply what you've learned. You can do that by leaving a comment on iTunes or in the show notes at nickblevins.com.